Okay, so welcome to this next class on a new section which is going to be about scale and infrastructure and today's class is an opening lecture generally talking about accounting for scale. Uh, I'm breaking it into two parts. One where I'll talk about scaling up food chains and in particular how uh, tactics such as standards are used to coordinate action across large distances but not just as a technical problem but also a cultural and social vision of food and agriculture and then in the second part I'll talk about food processing and its importance in these food chains and the packaging revolution in retailing and how we have changed our relationship to food because of these innovations. So you will hear terms in food studies such as food ways or uh, commodity chain analysis and farm to fork. And I wanted to take a moment to have us think about what these expressions mean. If you hear the word food ways, it's used with anthropologists and in food studies to mean the traditional customs or habits of a group of people concerning food and eating. And it comes from the, the word folk way and the strength of this is that it focuses on regions, uh, it looks at practices, habits, and customs. Uh, you can see how food flows through this region. Uh, the disadvantage, of course, is that they're often static. You, when people talk about food ways, often they're doing it as a kind of uh, enclosed set cultural practice and not thinking about how these food ways change over time. Uh, another set of scholars will use the expression food chains, and here you can imagine linkages across different spaces, and uh, what these tend to look at is the flow of food through this change. Um, one of the most famous intellectual traditions in this commodity chain analysis tradition would be Emmanuel Wallerstein, who's famous for his world systems theory. Um, and in it, he defines a commodity chain as a network of labor and production processes whose end result is a finished commodity. So again, it tends to be linear. You can see how from the farm field into different spaces, including food processing, you reach this final commodity, which is the food product that gets on our, our table. Um, so recently in policy circles and in and alternative food movements, you'll have people talk about policies built around farm to fork. Now, I in my classes would often pause here and use an exercise that I got from Roger Horowitz, um, which involves putting on a blackboard on one end farm, drawing these arrows across to the other end dinner, and asking my students to answer the question, what steps do you need to fit in between the farm and fork to move food across from the farmer to the consumer. If you'd like to practice this, I encourage you to pause the video right now and on a piece of paper, try to think what are the intermediate steps um, that are involved in this. The exercise is really great. One, to see what do students already know and second, because very quickly it can get complex. People start to talk about processing and trucking um, maybe they'll think about the fact that research is done to improve food, uh, that before it gets to the, the, the consumer from the manufacturer, you have retailers, marketplaces. So at some point, um, you can stop and draw attention to how complicated it is to bring food uh, to our tables. So on this next slide, for example, I then illustrate for the student uh, some of the things that they might have noticed, but also even other additional considerations, such as the cooperative, um, where farmers form a cooperative around one particular product, say tomatoes or uh, other kinds of produce, um, and they may then be an intermediary between the manufacturer and the farmer. Similarly, you can see on this chain, as we start to get more and more complicated, the farmer is not even the starting point. The chemical industry provides fertilizers. The farmer is also a consumer. The farmer needs to buy these, these inputs maybe seeds and new varieties from the research center before they produce uh, the raw plant that becomes our food. And at the other end, uh, but you have the retailer as an important stakeholder and someone who negotiates with the consumer about the price and the quality and the value of the food and then negotiates with wholesalers or importers. Uh, and a very important player in all of this, the transporter. Um, so 
Moving on, suddenly what looks like a line or linear flow can quickly become a web. Um, even if you just focus on food, the people who are producing food, processing food, quickly you discover are also processing or buying products from other industries. Um, so the farmer, instead of being at the start of this chain, is actually enmeshed in a, a wide variety of entrance bet uh, interests between the grain seed merchant, the oil seed person, um, logistics providers for the various different inputs that go into farming. Uh, they then rely upon farm information management. One stakeholder that you don't see in this slide, banks. Banks finance the farmer. Banks often have an interest in each harvest and whether it's going to then be possible for them to pay back loans. This is an important part of policy. And similarly, going towards the consumer, the consumer uh, relies on food retailer, but the consumer might also be uh, working in the system and therefore involved in it. So it quickly becomes this web. I don't expect you to read all of them, but you get an idea of its complexity. And a really important point here is that all of these relationships are dynamic. It's not that they have this necessary continuity. Um, at each point, instead of it being a chain linking, it's also a place where power is enacted. Uh, the different stakeholders might be negotiating, um, they might be in conflict, there might be price wars. So when you hear about food chains or food ways, the emphasis is on coordination and linkages. But I want you to think instead about how these are highly contingent um, and fraught with struggle and antagonism. Now, despite these antagonisms, moving food through all of these different spaces requires a great deal of technical coordination. And typically this is known as standardization. Um, both the food itself has to become standardized so that it's recognized and flows through this in a smooth way, but also all of the, the components that process the food or the labeling that goes into uh, clarifying the food so that you can follow it in the system all of this has to be standardized, including practices and market measures of, of value and price. So I, I want to pause for a moment and talk about this process of standardization. Uh, for standardization to work, you have these three technical steps. First, you have to create a common unit of measurement that allows you to encode everything. And thus, second, every kind of item that fits into the standard system has to have at least some place in a category. Um, everything has to fit into the new standardized system. And then three, that thing no longer is about its unique individual background, but instead reappears in this system as a part of a series and a total classificatory grid. This is a kind of technical way of thinking about standardization, about how you transform a local type of produce or food into something that can be measured in stock markets in large scale, um, in large numbers. What I tell my science and engineering students, though, is that this is not just a technical process. Um, in fact, it is also a, a particular vision. And that vision is a shift from local, contextual, and often historically specific understanding of the product to a universal, functional, and uh, understanding that doesn't depend on context for a particular moment in time. The idea is that you're trying to transform food or these products, these commodities, into something that can circulate through the globe independent of local cultural ideas about value and price. Um, now, two important clarifications. First, and this is not specific to food, but in general about creating a universal measure. There is no such thing as a naturally occurring logical standard. Instead, it's important to think of standards as conventions. They do draw upon reasoning in nature and reasoning about uh, whether it works best for some uh, reason uh, in technical sense, but they're also about a social agreement about what is preferred. Um, and in this sense, they can become important in particular power struggles. So here on this slide, you can see a variety of disputes where over what should be the standard. The most famous is the United States with its uh, arbitrary, as this slide says, retarded roller coaster 
uh, measurement system and the rest of the world that has adopted the metric system. And the metric system, as it becomes universally adopted, starts to look more objective, more uh, rational. But even the metric system has a long history of, of how its introduction in, in, during the French Revolution reflected a particular vision of, of the world. Um, it was based on the idea of a decimal written system used instead of other uh, number systems, such as the Babylonian sexagesimal base 60 number system. And it wasn't complete. We don't have time, the time of day, in a 10 base system. We still use a 60 base system for many things. Um, we also use it for measurements of angle and space because in Babylonian time, they were very interested in astronomy and, and circular motion. So we still have that tradition. Um, we use other measurement systems for computing um, and they have different advantages. Uh, the Babylonian sexagesimal base system system, if you read about it, the base 60 system is based on the fact that you have five fingers on one hand and five on the other and you can count. And so if you want to understand it, your four fingers here each have three parts. You start with one in your second hand and you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And you continue this with all five fingers, eventually you get to sixty. And in a system where you had to do fast math and your technology were your hands, this was actually a very rational system. Later, when you had a written system, the 10 base system became more rational. Similar here, you have a, a, a XKCD comic talking about the trade-offs of which system, Celsius or Fahrenheit, is more rational. Fahrenheit represents better a wider diversity in the range that most humans live in. Many humans live below freezing, so making the freezing point zero may not be rational for people who live in cold climates. Um, and we could all get upset and say we should use Kelvin because Kelvin starts with the absolute base system. Um, but to say that one is more rational than another is to ignore the trade-offs of these different systems. A second important clarification is that these standards reflect a view from a particular physical or social position. Um, so they may seem natural to one person, but unnatural to another. And a great example of this are maps and city planning. So here in this slide, I have a picture of a, a Valencia, Spain, where I lived for many years. And then on the right, the famous image of Manhattan and its grid street system. And I like to ask my students to describe them. What's the difference between the two? And what you can see very quickly is that in the grid system, it's perfectly east-west, north-south streets. Um, from above, it looks orderly and rational. You understand the organization. Um, the Valencia Street from above looks less clear, although you can see natural outlines like the river. Um, if you know a little bit about medieval history, you can understand that the, the bottom of the circle of the city center is the old city wall. It reflects a militaristic interest of defending the city from attack, something not important to New York City anymore. Um, and you experience these two cognitively different, differently. If you are an outsider and you come to New York City with just a basic aerial view, you know how to navigate, even with no understanding of the local context. Um, it might not be more efficient. If everyone needs to move from one point in the grid to a diagonal point in the grid, getting there requires a lot of 90 degree turns and a lot of time. In Valencia, the path reflects usage. And so getting from the outside to the center might be actually faster and more efficient. It also doesn't favor local knowledge. Um, in Valencia, people would know how to navigate these local streets. Um, and so even though they look chaotic from the outside, once you have local knowledge, you're fine. If you try to conquer it from the outside without this knowledge, it can be quite confusing. So it favors local um, over universal knowledge. Now, bringing this back to the context of agriculture, you can see this in the layout of, of crop lands, um, particularly in the American West. If you ever fly in an airplane over the western parts of the United States, you're going to see these nice, rational square lines dividing up. They seem to ignore the natural terrain. They refashion the earth into this organizational form. In another week, I'm going to talk about how this approach has been critiqued by the deep ecology movement um, who argue that we need to have 
move away from these unnatural kinds of lines that reflect an enlightenment ideal um, and grid pattern and move towards a more natural, um, diverse approach. More importantly, if you look at the bigger map of the United States, what you really see with these straight lines moving west is a, is a story of conquest. Um, when the colonists first settled in the east, the state lines were drawn around natural, natural barriers, rivers, mountains. Um, they tended to be smaller because movement across those barriers was slower. And people cared about the natural terrain because it wrapped up in their identity about how to divide boundaries. Looking west, where they, they, most people didn't live, they drew it differently. The east didn't care about things like the Rocky Mountains or rivers. And so you can get this bizarre, unnatural, but yet totally legible result of Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona forming this perfect intersection of a line, of two lines. Um, and another level of uh, imperialistic intervention is that this is terra nullius, empty land. So when they draw this map of the West, the, the colonists in the East um, are not thinking about the ways that Native Americans might have drawn these maps and the ways that they would have formed these, these borders. And this kind of rational, neat kind of line drawing that looks uh, intuitive to someone drawing a map in the East to the Native Americans would look incredibly unintuitive. And this has resulted in, in great wars, not just in the United States, but you see this in um, Eastern Europe, and you can see this in the Middle East, where this kind of neat, clean line drawing from far that looks rational in the ground doesn't make much sense. The other context of the United States that's important to keep in mind is the technological changes happening. Now, in 1830 in the United States, if you look at this diagram from William Cronin's book, Nature's Metropolis, you can see concentric circles drawn based on how many days it took to head west. And it's all compressed to get, it took a week to get just past the Appalachian Mountains um, and many, many weeks to reach west as far as Chicago or, or the hinterlands. Um, only 25 years later in 1857, you can see those lines pushed farther west. In one day now you can cross the Appalachians, in two you can get to Chicago, um, in a matter of weeks you can get to the other coast. And if you think about that time-space compression, if you think about uh, what David Harvey calls time-space compression, you're also imagining very different markets. Because food spoils, and so in one or two days you can you can have a market exchange with food products um, that is meaningful. You can produce food uh, now in the areas around Chicago that would then be fed back in New York. That also means now farmers in the New York area are competing with farmers in Chicago over the quality of whose product is better. Um, and so this has dramatic consequences on, on, our, on our food supply. In order for this to work, you have the rise of a new kind of industry, which is distribution. And so these images, this image here, are from a series of pamphlets from the Armour and Company, uh, published just after World War I, where they're celebrating Armour and Company's, uh, a very important meat producer, um, innovation in distribution and moving foods across this great nation. And as they say, in the pamphlet, the perishable riches of a thousand fields and farms would waste while people hungered, except for distribution, that intricate though inconspicuous mechanism, which bridges chasms of space and time, bringing the abundance from lands of plenty to dependent multitudes of men. So this is very much in the celebration of progress um, and how through tra train technologies, packaging technologies, shipping, transportation technologies, the distributor is able to move food now across wide spaces and therefore support uh, populations with more natural resources. So to wrap up this first part of the class, uh, with the rise of this distribution industry and with the scaling up um, of markets, you have a focus on how to take advantage of economies of scale. And one question I might ask for people thinking about the Chicago Union Stockyard, for example, which was famous for its uh, 
for slaughtering of animals and creating meat, but I might ask you, what is the commodity of the Union Stockyard? Is the commodity the meat? Is the commodity the animals coming in? Or is it something else? Um, the concern as you start scaling up and you start dealing with hundreds, thousands of animals are concerns with waste. How do you prevent all of this waste? How do you prevent decomposition of all the different products? And so this concern became a scientific challenge, but also an economic opportunity. And so there's a famous line from Upton Sinclair's The Jungles, the packers, the meat packers, use everything in the hog except the squeals. And out of this new scale, you have the creation of new byproduct industries. Um, meat producers were also making lard from the fat, glue from other parts of the animals, brushes from the hairs on the cattle, candle from the fat as well. Most of the big producers of vegetable oils were also not just for cooking oils, but also producing soap. Um, you had people making fertilizer from the, the manure. The late 19th century invention of oleomargarine, um, which would later be known as margarine, came out of this new science that was trying to turn the waste or the, the excess scales of the uh, f new food processing plants into an opportunity for new markets. And each of these new markets resituates the food distributor and the food processors and manufacturers in a web of other markets. Now they're suddenly producing um, uh, fertilizers to be used elsewhere in farming, but also candles and soaps to be used in households um, and glue to be used in industry. So again, further complicating the web that we first opened up with this lecture.